today we are going to talk about celiac disease why we have chosen celiac disease as you all know celiac disease is not a very uncommon disease in india which has got myriad of presentations and patient the interesting thing is the patient with this disease can land up in any department i will be mentioning that in my subsequent slides the slides are not moving what is celiac disease this is called as celiac sprue gluten sensitive enteropathy or non tropical sprue these are the names which have been given to patients with celiac disease this is a systemic disease with a permanent intolerance to gluten it is a chronic disease it is triggered by a gluten ingestion which is a complex of water insoluble wheat rye or barley products in genetically predisposed individuals which has got autoimmune enteropathy associated with hla dq2 or dq8 predominantly involves small intestinal villus abnormality in the form of atrophy causes small absorption of multiple nutrients leading to different manifestations interestingly gluten free diet causes resolution of symptoms that means exclusion of some diet helps in resolution of symptoms and interesting part is the relapse of re relapse of symptoms are there with reintroduction of gluten so a disease caused by a nutrient leading to mal absorption resolution of symptoms by exclusion of a diet in gluten high diet and the relapse of symptoms when we reintroduce the gluten that is the uh, features of celiac disease coming to how the disease was diagnosed in the past the disease was diagnosed way back in 250 ad why do we need to know about the history because this is important to know because what our precedents are our seniors and our uh, uh, people in the past how much hard work they have put to diagnose this peculiar disease this was first diagnosed in 2000 250 ad where it was called as a problem of digestion with chronic perturbation of digestion and anadosis that means absorption defect which was called as celiac diathesis in 1988 samuel b published first modern clinical detail of description of celiac disease and the role of diet in this particular disease in 1908 Christian Hetter linked celiac disease to growth retardation for which for a long time this celiac disease was known as G Hetter disease in 1940 the main work done was by a dutch pediatrician how he came to know about this particular disease what happened during the world war it was there was scarcity of bread which was not available to the patients in the ward of diarrhea and one of the uh, mother of a patient addressed this issue that the patients who were not getting food in the form of bread they somehow improved in their diarrhea and once the war was over when the bread was reintroduced they had symptoms so this particular observation was picked up by dust predation and he linked that this particular disease was linked to somehow grain consumption and the next series came in this particular disease in 
histological abnormalities in celiac disease were diagnosed later on serology came in the form of anti ttg and in 1972 a linkage to hla was done in patients with celiac disease in india the first report came from india in 1965 there was a big gap after that isolated reports came in 2006 the prevalence was studied in school children and it the it was seen around 1 in 3310 that this was the prevalence and in 2009 number of reports they came in pediatric population especially from north india most of the reports came from north india as north is a wheat eating area whereas later on few reports came from south india also although it is a predominantly uh, rice eating areas what is gluten basically this is a protein derived from gramini or triticae tribe we contains gluten which is a combination of monomeric water soluble gliadin and multimeric water insoluble glutenin in rye the uh, component is known as sickelin in barley the this is known as hordin all these contain prolamin from other grains which also propagate inflammation oats although phylogenetically they are more distant but they share some of the similarities which can induce symptoms in some patients so gluten is basically proline and glutamine rich proteins which activates immune response in celiac disease and the high proline content makes the gluten resistant to basically the proline has a characteristic that makes it resistant to the brush border enzymes that is peptidases as the this component is not metabolized by peptidases so lot of gluten that comes as a load to the small intestine leading to the uh, injury to the intestinal mucosa i will be telling how the intestinal mucosa is damaged by presence of gluten the slides are not moving acha theek how common the celiac disease is this is not so uncommon the prevalence is around 1% however what we see in our population most of the cases they remain undiagnosed and us the prevalence is 1 in 1 uh, around 133 and the this prevalence increases in first degree relatives that is the patient who is the case of celiac disease if we test their parents child or siblings this prevalence is very high one in 22 in europe the prevalence is just uh, as in worldwide finland it's more although this is not a wheat uh, predominantly wheat eating area but high prevalence is reported in north india it is one in 96 and out of them atypical variety is more common female to male ratio is 1.3 to 2.1 that is it's more commonly diagnosed in males as compared to females prevalence all over world is there uh, you can see from asia europe north america even south america the all, almost all over the world this is distributed and the figure is around 1% all over uh, world how celiac disease is induced by presence of gluten this is very important to understand what happens the gluten peptides they reach the lamina propria lamina propria of small intestine through the leaky gut what happens the mucosal tight junctions they become leaky because of increased intestinal permeability how this permeability increases either due to some drugs or some bacterial dysbiosis which induces disassembly of enterocyte tight junctions so the first step which happens in celiac disease is a loss of tightness of uh, enterocyte tight junction then the gluten peptide which enters inside the 
lamina propria of small intestine. This gets deaminated by TTG or tissue transglutaminase. Thereby, what happens? This gluten peptide is presented to antigen presenting cells. What are these antigen pre presenting cells? These are dendritic cells and macrophages, which has uh, which exhibit in a genetically predisposed person as MHA. MHC class uh, two antigens that is HLA DQ2 or DQ8. So a person who is genetically predisposed for celiac, they have their antigen presenting cells with these haplotypes of helper HLA DQ2 and DQ8. When this gluten is attached to these antigen processing cells, this complex triggers the helper T1 and helper T2 immune response. Thereby, the, uh, thereby, what happens? This leads to mucosal cytotoxicity, inflammation, and autoimmune extra-intestinal phenomena. So all these leads to, this is the diagrammatic representation of what happens in the pathogenesis of celiac disease in each other. I will just explain it. You can see, this is the dietary trigger, that is the gluten peptide. This enters, these are the enterocyte, that is, this is the lumen, and this is the lamina propria of small intestine. So this is the brush powder. What happens, the dietary gluten comes here. Through this leaky, tight junctions, it enters inside the lamina propria. This comes, this is deaminated, and this is presented to antigen processing cells, which already has HLA, DQ2, or DQ8. When this deaminated gluten attaches with this complex, and this complex is formed, this complex stimulates CD4 uh, cells, which leads to uh, uh, Th1 or Th2 re response, basically helper T cell and helper uh, uh, T1 and T2 response is stimulated, which leads to formation of antibodies as well as NK cells are stimulated. Through NK cell stimulation, the cytokines in the form of interferon or TNF alpha that comes, which leads to mucosal abnormality in the form of villus, villus atrophy and intra villus atrophy and int, mucosal villus atrophy and intra epithelial lymphocytosis that occurs this in in turn leads to collection of intra epithelial cells here interferon uh, interleukin 15 that acts in other, B cell response is in the form of anti gliding and anti tissue transglutaminase, which leads to autoimmunity and thereby intestinal and extra intestinal symptoms they appear. These are the antibodies which we test in serum and which leads to serology, which helps in uh, serological diagnosis of celiac disease. What are the clinical manifestations? As I have already mentioned, that patients with celiac disease can present in any department. The varied presentation is, one is a subclinical celiac disease in which celiac specific serology is present. Patients, when we do endoscopy and duodenal biopsy, they have gluten enteropathy, but they don't have symptoms. The second group is potential celiac disease in which the celiac specific serology is there, when we do small intestinal histology, that is normal. These patients are known as potential celiac disease. They can develop celiac disease in future when they are exposed to different antigens uh, or gluten in the future. Then comes the classical celiac disease, which is more common in children. They, they can come with diarrhea, abdominal pain, weight loss, nutritional deficiencies, 
Some of them, they can paradoxically come as a chronic constipation also, abdominal distension, GRD, or obesity. So these are the varied presentation which can be seen in children specifically. They come with nutritional deficiency in the form of anemia. Iron deficiency anemia is a very common clinical presentation or growth retardation. These are the common features which are seen in patients with celiac disease. Then coming to the non-classical symptoms, these are the symptoms which are more commonly seen in adult population. They can come with general symptoms in the form of anemia, fatigue, or abdominal bloating, or they can, patients can land up in orthopedics department in the form of pathological fractures, osteopenia, or arthralgias. Patients come to gynae department with the symptoms of infertility, delayed puberty, or short stature. As far as liver is concerned, patients with celiac disease can have raised transaminases. They can have fatty liver. They can have autoimmune hepatitis. They present with primary biliary cirrhosis or cholangitis or PSC or primary sclerosing cholangitis. So all these varied presentation can be there patient, in patients with celiac disease. Patient can land up in uh, dental department with tooth enamel defects. ENT department with recurrent after ulcers. These patients selectively, they have IgA deficiency, which is 10 to 20 times more common in patients with celiac disease. Associated, celiac can be associated with number of genetic disorders also. Whenever patients with Down syndrome, they come with GI symptoms, they will test them for celiac disease, Turner syndrome or Williams syndrome. They have more association with celiac disease. Skin is a very common presentation in patients with uh, celiac disease. Almost 90% of patients with celiac disease, more than 90% in fact, they develop dermatitis uh, herpetiformis. Uh, in the opposite way, 20% of celiac disease over a period of time, they develop dermatitis uh, herpetiformis. How do we diagnose? We can diagnose this by skin biopsy in which we see IgA deposits, which can be seen in dermis. This problem responds to gluten-free diet. How clinically these patients, they present with pruritic articarial papules and vesicles on the skin of elbow, buttocks and knees. So patients coming to skin department with skin problem, having underlying problem of celiac disease, which responds to gluten-free diet. So early diagnosis and treatment is very important in skin department also. Patients can land up in neurological department or neurology department with ataxia, which is known as gluten ataxia. This is basically autoimmune injury to the cerebellum. MRI shows atrophy of cerebellum in almost 60% of cases. The mean age is around 50 years. And the response to gluten-free diet, diet, it may or may not respond. Second comes the gluten neuropathy. They can have sensitive neuropathy affecting hands or feet. And the age is around fifth decade. And the response to gluten-free diet can be there regardless of presence or absence of uh, enteropathy in the, these patients. Interestingly, a syndrome has been described in which patients with celiac disease, they have ataxia and occipital calcification. So you can see the varied presentation with ataxia, neuropathy, and uh, different presentation in neuro department. Then comes how and when we should recommend celiac disease screening in patients. What are the underlying diseases in which we should screen? One is the persistent unexplained pain abdomen, growth retardation, patients with fatigue, patients with unexpected weight loss, severe mouth ulcers, unexplained iron B12 or folate deficiency, patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus, autoimmune thyroiditis, IBS, and first degree relatives of celiac disease. Unexplained persistent raised transaminases are other areas in which we must get celiac serology done, metabolic bone disorders, 
unexplained, unexplained subfertility or recurrent abortions, unexplained neurological symptoms, Down syndrome and Turner syndrome. Look at the varied and uh, various presentation to different departments and different specialties in which patient with celiac disease can land up. So the main diagnosis of celiac disease is we have three main pillars. One is a serology. Second is a duodenal histology. Third is a genetic testing. Duodenal histology, we do upper GI endoscopy and we take duodenal biopsy. I will explain that. Coming first to the serological diagnosis, the main antibody which is important in patients with celiac disease is anti-TTG, that is anti-tissue transglutaminase uh, IgA variety and also serum IgA level. This can be done by ELISA and the quantification is also possible. This is a mistake in, uh, this is basically ELISA. Why do we need anti-TTG? IgA and serum IgA level because when we screen these patients to TTG level, this is IgA variety. And if a patient is deficient in IgA, they have inherited IgA deficiency. In those cases, even the patient is celiac, but this response will not be safe. So the combo of anti-TTG and serum IgA is the first test we do in patients with celiac disease which has got sensitivity, very high sensitivity and specificity to more than 96 to 98%. Then comes the second important antibodies is anti-endomycial antibody. That is again IgA variety. This reacts to the same antigen of TTG, but the antigen is bound to tissues. This requires use of immunofluorescence in tissues from primates of esophagus and, and human umbilical cord. Although this is more ex expensive, technically more challenging, but, and also operator dependent, and only quant qualitative assessment is possible. But the specificity of anti-endomycel is very, very high. So this is the most specific test which can be used for confirmation when TTG level is less than two times normal. In those cases, even if anti-endomycel is positive, then we can diagnose celiac disease. Then comes uh, anti-TTG, IgG variety. Previously, we were doing IgA variety. Now, anti-TTG, IgG, and anti-endomycel, IgG. Both of them, IgG uh, variant has got low sensitivity and specificity. So, we don't order it. Many a time, we... Uh, people, they write only anti-TTG. So we must specify anti-TTG IgA and also anti-endomycel IgA because IgG variant has got low sensitivity as well as specificity. Anti-glided antibody, although they were first to be diagnosed in diagnosis of celiac disease, they also have low sensitivity and low specificity. Recently, the work has been done on de-amidiated glided peptide or known as DGP IgG variety. This has got 88% sensitivity and almost 99% specificity. Especially, this is, this is IgG variety. So people with IgA deficiency, they still be having this particular peptide which is positive. So we can diagnose celiac disease, when patient is IgA deficient by use of this de-amidated glided peptide or DGP IgG. This is the algorithm which we use in patients with celiac disease for diagnosis. We do screening tests in the form of anti-TTG IgA and total serum IgA level to take care of the patient is not IgA deficient. If that is found to be positive, we do confirm these patients with upper GI endoscopy and duodenal biopsies. If biopsy is consistent with celiac disease in the form of MARSH classification, which I will be explaining later on, that is, the, this is the confirmed celiac disease. If biopsy is not consistent, that means the biopsy is normal and we have only serology positive, these are the patients which are called as potential celiac disease. If anti-TTG is negative, and total IgA, this is negative. 
the celiac disease is unlikely. But if we have strong clinical suspicion of this disease, then we get a HLA testing done. Then if HLA is positive, we do upper GI endoscopy and duodenal biopsy. If the biopsies are positive, then we uh, say these are zero negative, basically zero negative celiac disease. And if HLA is also negative, then celiac disease can be excluded with uh, almost 100% positive predictive. Negative, uh, basically, we can uh, rule out celiac disease in that patient. We can have some false positive anti-TTG positivity in the patients with GRDI and Lamblia infection. Some of the patients with chronic liver disease can have this congestive heart failure. Patients with hypergamma globinemia and autoimmune diseases. So that's why the, we cannot diagnose celiac disease only on the basis of anti-TTG value because false positive, although false positive may indicate potential celiac disease, but the sole diagnosis cannot be made by presence of only anti-TTG. We need other uh, parameters in the form of either duodenal biopsy or uh, this HLA testing before labeling it as a uh, celiac disease. Falsely, patient may be celiac, but we may have negative TTG in the form of when a child is very young. In patients in less than two years, sometimes these antibodies are in low titers. Patient who has already been put on gluten-free diet, in those cases, the level of anti-TTG decreases in spite of being uh, having celiac disease. Patients with selective IgA deficiency, because this is a IgA variant we, which what we are testing if the person is already having IgA deficiency. So this response of anti-TTG will not be there. And patients with mild celiac enteropathy may not have this high level of anti-TTG. So we need other parameters to diagnose if we have clinical strong clinical suspicion of celiac disease. Use of anti-DGP or deaminated gliadin peptide IgG variety. This is useful in patients in which small intestinal biopsy is consistent with celiac disease, but anti-TTG IgA is negative. Or patients in which we have anti-gliadin antibody test positive, but who have IgA and TTG negative, or patients with severe Ig, uh, basically uh, IgA deficiency in patients. In those cases, this deaminated gliadin peptide IgG variety can be uh, useful to diagnose celiac disease. What do we see in patients with endoscopy in patients with celiac disease? The endoscopic findings are very much uh, uh, sensitive. They are not so sensitive. But specificity is there to the tune of uh, 99%. Patients can have mucosal atrophy, fissuring, and mosaic pattern, which can be seen in this uh, diagram. But other features are also there, loss of duodenal folds, duodenal mucosa, submucosal folds. But these are only the visual impressions. We must take biopsies to diagnose patients with celiac disease. At least we should take six duodenal biopsies and as the disease is basically patchy to begin with, so uh, multiple biopsies need to be taken and one or two biopsies should be taken from the duodenal bulb. It has seen that it increases the yield in patients with celiac disease and the biopsies should be taken with single piece at one time. This is very important as, as a gastroenterologist we must not use uh, multi-bite forceps in which we can take two to three biopsies at one uh, single shot because the tangential biopsies by multi-bite may overestimate villus atrophy and patient should be on gluten containing diet. Why? Because if the person is already put on gluten-free diet, the histological changes may revert over a period of time and we may not diagnose celiac disease if the patient is already on gluten-free diet in spite of taking duodenal biopsies. This is the histology or mo modified MARSH classification. 
which has been uh, used in which we see intraepithelial lymphocytosis, the level should be more than 25 cells per 100 enterocyte. The second is the crypt hyperplasia, which is seen in patients with celiac disease. Then comes the villus atrophy and villus crypt uh, ratio. In normal population, this is 3 to 5.1. When there, there is partial villus atrophy, then this ratio decreases. And when there is total villus atrophy, this ratio becomes almost zero. So the totally flat mucosa is seen in patients with celiac disease with uh, fluorid uh, manifestation. HLA DQ2 and 8 typing, this is important in patients. This negative HLA DQ2 or 8, this makes celiac disease highly unlikely. That is the positive predictive values almost 99%. Out of these HLA DQ2.5 is has got more predisposition and it must be uh, distinguished from HLA, other uh, HLAs in which the, there is low predisposition. Patient, this test should not be used routinely to diagnose celiac disease. Although this is not affected by dietary gluten, if the patient is on a uh, gluten-free diet, then other markers may become negative, but this test will remain positive. So whom to test? Patients already on gluten-free diet before testing. Patients with MASH 1 or 2 histology, but negative serology to say that this person has celiac. Sibling of celiac disease for likelihood of disease. If they are positive for HLA, they are likely to have celiac disease in future. And in some patients with genetic and autoimmune diseases in which we know, want to know the link between autoimmune diseases and celiac, in those cases, patients should get the HLA typing. Absence of HLA DQ2 uh, or 8 has a negative predictive value for virtually almost 100% cases. Usefulness is there in zero negative patients. Patients on gluten-free diet who are unable or unwilling to undergo a gluten challenge. Once a patient is already on gluten-free diet and if you want to uh, check for the serology or histology, Generally, we start, we start with gluten and then take the serology and biopsy. But some of the patients, they have uh, increase in symptoms while taking uh, gluten who were already on gluten-free diet. They don't want to take this challenge. In those cases, HLA testing can be helpful. And patients who are refusing endoscopy, they can get HLA testing done. Uh, that comes the video capsule endoscopy in which we pass a capsule. We give a capsule which has got an inbuilt camera made inside and the capsule passes through the small intestine and take multiple photographs. We can check that uh, just like halter monitoring. That has got a sensitivity, very high sensitivity and specificity. Although the test is very costly, this is not used as an initial diagnostic test except in patients with positive serology and who do not want to undergo endoscopy and biopsy, in those cases, this uh, video capsule endoscopy can be done. The disadvantage of this is although we can screen more areas by video capsule endoscopy, but we cannot take biopsy because this is a uh, patient takes a capsule which comes out making a video of small intestine and uh, uh, we uh, don't uh, we cannot take biopsies. This is strongly recommended if a patient gets, say, complication in the form of, say, patient has got severe ulceration in the small intestine, multiple ulceration, or severe ulcerogegenitis. In those cases, by giving a capsule to the patient, which can take a photograph of entire small intestine and we can know the extent of disease or if any uh, abnormal area is there which can be uh, seen by capsule endoscopy where we can take biopsies. Extensive mucosal damage can be uh, assessed by this uh, capsule endoscopy, especially in type 2 refractory celiac disease. I will be explaining that in later. These are the radiological findings. We can get a barium done, we can get a CT done. We have typical findings of flocculation, reversal of fold, laminal flow, 
flocculation dilution and uh, these findings although they are not specific for celiac disease but they depict malabsorption on barium we can get some lymph nodes we can get tele telescoping uh, in uh, intestine we can have large volume in small intestine large volume in colon basically all these shows malabsorption so all these findings are, although they show malabsorption they are not specific to celiac disease they can be seen in disorders of malabsorption of small intestine of, of any etiology so a triple combination of we have seen that almost patients with genetic positive positive genetic test that is hla positive anti endomycel antibody which is very specific and more than 10 folds increase in anti ttg all these three combination can give almost 100% positive predictive value so it can be used as a european guidelines they have seen, uh, said that in patients children with ttg more than 10 times of upper limit of normal positive anti endomycel antibody we can make a diagnosis of celiac disease even without genetic testing and even without doing a duodenal biopsy some of the recent newer tests have come in patients with uh, celiac disease they are intestinal fatty acid binding protein ifab this is a basically marker of enterocyte injury this is seen in patients with celiac disease in higher level which normalizes after gluten free uh, diet this has got a role in protecting adherence to basically uh, uh, patient if we want to see the assessment if we want to assess the patient is adhering to gluten free diet or not in those cases this uh, value can be seen or if person has accidentally ingested gluten in those cases we can do this level then comes the flow cytometry which recognizes basically blood cd4 t cells which binds to hla dq gluten tetramers thereby this can differentiate patients with celiac disease from control even on patients who are already on gluten free diet so flow cytometry has got its own value fi uh, basically fatty acid binding protein has got uh, its own value so these are the advanced tests which can be done in patients although they are available only in uh, selected centers we can may have in future these tests very common commonly seen patients who have villus atrophy although the most common cause is celiac disease but we have number of causes of villus atrophy they can be autoimmune enteropathy combined uh, variable immunodeficiency patients with crohn disease eosinophilic enteritis different infections like in the form of giardia whipple's disease tuberculosis hiv enteropathy tropical flu small intestinal bacterial overgrowth different lymphoproliferative diseases and a group of drugs which can cause this villus atrophy so just by looking at villus atrophy we cannot diagnose celiac disease so that's why we need a combination of serology histology and if required the hla testing what are the drugs which can cause enteropathy these are the nsaids which is very commonly used by the patients immunosuppressives in the form of azathioprine mycophenolate or methotrexate ace inhibitors especially the olmisetron has been linked to the villus atrophy in patients with uh, duodenal biopsy or secondary to uh, in chronic diarrhea we can differentiate celiac disease from non celiac disease villus atrophy by doing basically the different population of cells which can be seen we, if we have predominantly intraepithelial lymphocyte as cd8 cells that shows this is celiac disease and if this is a mixture of cd4 and cd8 that that shows the cause of villus atrophy is non celiac Uh, i will skip this uh, a word about gluten uh, disorders basically the gluten related disorders can be in three forms one is a ige mediated that is food allergies some patients they say when we take, take uh, roti 
they get severe allergic reaction. This is IgE mediated food allergies. Then comes the celiac disease in which wheat is taken and that causes some immune injury leading to celiac disease in which there is villus atrophy along with other extra intestinal manifestation. A new term has come up as a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. What is that? That is non-allergic, non-immune mediated in which we make a clinical diagnosis. How do we make? The patient says that they have symptoms correlation with gluten in injection. When we do celiac serology, that is negative. When we do duodenal biopsy, that is also negative. And these patients, when they are given free trial of free trial of three months trial of gluten-free diet, they respond. And when we when we reintroduce gluten, the again the symptoms they come. So this is known as non-allergic, non-immune mediated, or that is known as non-celiac gluten sensitivity. This is a new term which has come up. Many patients they come to us. Many patients they come to us. Many patients they come to us with the, the symptoms of symptoms of uh, malabsorption or uh, symptoms induced by symptoms of malabsorption by ingestion of celiac uh, gluten. So in those cases, patients can uh, have basically uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. How do we uh, say when patient is already put on gluten, what is the treatment of gluten-free, gluten-free uh, uh, treatment of celiac disease? Basically, this is basically gluten-free diet, which is recommended to these patients. But some of the patients, they get refractory cilia. What is refractory cilia? That is a disease in which patient is already put on a gluten-free diet, but they have persistent or recurrent symptoms. In those cases, what we do, we get a TTG concentration done. If concentration is positive, that means the patient is having some uh, contamination of wheat in his diet, then patient is referred to dietitian. And we, if we do endoscopic biopsy, that also shows villus atrophy. Over a period of time, if patient continues to have pure gluten-free diet and still the villus atrophy persists, then we say this is a refractory cilia. If patient TTG concentration is negative, then that means the symptoms are not related to celiac disease. We must rule out other disorders like lactose intolerance, fructose intolerance, SIBO, uh, this is basically a mistake, uh, IBS or pancreatic insufficiency. So other alternative diagnosis to celiac disease should be looked into. So non-responsive celiac disease, we have a very uh, big uh, 99 cases series from GB Panth Hospital in which it was seen that the gluten contamination was the main factor which was responsible for non-responsive celiac disease. The second was the IBS miscellaneous or refractory celiac disease were only less than 10%. So the refractory celiac disease are of two types, type one and type two, in which aberrant intra-epithelial uh, lymphocytes, if they are present, this is type two. If there is no aberrant intra-epithelial lymphocytes are there, that is known as refractory uh, celiac disease type 1. How do we diagnose patients with refractory celiac disease? We review the di uh, diagnosis. We take a detailed clinical history for dietary review. We exclude other causes which can cause uh, these symptoms. Then we test for aberrant T cell response. We exclude malignancy. This is the stepwise approach in patients with refractory celiac disease. The specific treatment for type 1 uh, refractory celiac is steroid, azathioprine, or infliximab. So a word 
about refractory celiac disease type 1 is basically in which intraepithelial lymphocytes are predominantly normal. Their polyclonality of T cell receptors is there. They respond to steroid, bidonocide, or immunomodulator. Whereas type 2 is a basically T, apparent T cell response is there. They lack surface CD8 and CD3 expression while expressing the intracytoplasmic CD3. So they are aggressive, leading to aggressive ulcerative jejunoiliitis. Uh, Lot of malabsorption are there. So type 2 variety, that means, is more severe, more related to entropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma, and they do not respond to steroid. This is a very difficult condition to treat when these patients become. We may need uh, immunomodulators. They have higher risk of lymphoma association. We have other drugs also. Uh, we uh, can treat them with bone marrow transplant. And recently, a newer drugs which are there is IL-15. Uh, the drugs which acts on IL-15 is a new promising therapeutic strategy which can be uh, uh, used in patients with celiac disease, refractory. What are the long-term complications of celiac disease? That is uh, long-term untreated patients with celiac disease, they have high risk of enterocyte associated T cell lymphoma. They can develop intestinal adenocarcinoma. These patients, they have higher mortality, especially when the disease occurs in younger age. This mortality is influenced by age at which diagnosis occurs, how severe the presentation is, how much the patient is adhering to gluten-free diet, and how much is the amount of gluten he is consuming. So these patients, they have almost five-fold increased risk of dying from the infection or septicemia. So gluten-free diet improves most of the extra-intestinal manifestation in celiac disease and celiac disease-related complications, except for enamel defect, osteopenia, and ataxia. Most of the extra-intestinal features, they respond to gluten-free diet. What is gluten-free diet? When the Diet contains less than 20 part per million of gluten. That is almost six milligram per day. Why I am telling this figure? Because patients with celiac disease, we tell them to keep a different containers for making food. Why? Because even the small milli six milligram of gluten, which can be uh, if the same tawa or same chakla is used for making. Uh, chapati for patients with the celiac disease, this much contamination can occur. So small, even the small amount of contamination by gluten can lead to uh, non-response of uh, gluten-free diet. Patients should be aware that there are certain gluten containing other sources also. Patients, they say that we are keeping good uh, diet which is free of gluten, but toothpaste even the lipsticks, some of the capsule shells, they can have gluten in them. So that basically the tolerable amount of gluten is as low as one hundredth of a slice of a bread. So even the minimal amount of uh, gluten can give rise to symptoms. What happens with gluten-free diet? The GI symptoms, they improve in one month. They disappear by six months of gluten-free diet. And the zero negativity that becomes after six months. That means after six months of exactly responding to gluten-free diet, the patient can have betterment in symptoms also, as well as the serology also improves. The histology will remain positive. Even 17% uh, of patients, they will have positive serology even after one year of gluten-free diet. And serology, Basically, patients who are on gluten-free diet, how do, we, uh, how do we monitor these patients? This is by doing anti-TTG IgA level because quantification of this is possible. So we can say if the level decreases, that means the person is already adhering to gluten-free diet. Histology may take two to five years to normalize even patient is already on gluten-free diet. So 
this is very important to tell the patient that gluten free diet should be for lifelong although 20% of patient when, once they achieve remission if they restart they can maintain their histological remission after gluten reintroduction but when we do biopsies and when we do serology in these cases intra epithelial lymphocytes and the positive serology can remain positive and patients these patients are at increased risk of extra intestinal manifestation and later relapse so gluten free diet for life long is the treatment for patients with celiac disease we have some of the alternative therapies which are under experimental trials these are either we can mod modify the wheat grains these are known as genetically modified less immunogenic wheat grains can be uh, developed we are developing it but uh, we don't have that in market propyl endopeptidase these are the enzymes which can uh, degrade gluten so that becomes less harmful non absorbable polymers which has got high affinity for gliadin so the gliadin attaches to these non absorbable polymer and the that does not enter the lamina propria of small intestine so less injury is there that is also under development we are developing we are in the phase of developing drugs that can act on small intestinal permeability and gluten deaminidation uh, de step we have hla in we are in the process of developing hla inhibitors uh, as a gene therapy and other some of the drugs are being developed but all these are still experimental so till the time these things are not there we need to put the patients on gluten free diet so how do we monitor patients on gluten free diet patient should be monitored at 6 months and then every yearly for gluten free adherence symptoms serology micronutrient deficiencies and associated conditions they should test ttd iga counts serum iron folic acid b12 calcium thyroid vitamin d all these parameters they must improve if the patient is maintaining gluten free uh, diet they we can get a follow up endoscopy if the patient is not responding or having persistent of cyst symptoms despite gluten free diet bone densitometry should be assessed in patient every one or two yearly vaccination against pneumococcal h influenza or meningococcus is recommended because i have already told patients with celiac disease they are at higher risk for septicemia and some of the these infections so as preventive measures they should be vaccinated for pneumococci h influenza and meningococcal so thank you my talk on thrombophilia first of all i would like to thank you sir for giving me such a challenging topic because uh, as pathologists we normally shy away from uh, a uh, testing for th thrombophilia and refer to higher centers but there's lot we can do by just basic understanding of how to go about thrombophilia so what is thrombophilia thrombophilia is tendency for hypercoagulability like here you see that blood is flowing in a normal flow but in thrombophilia there is increased tendency for stasis and thrombus formation and uh, that can be in venous or in arterial uh, circulation and sometimes in few conditions it can be seen in both the sides but mostly generally we come across venous thrombo throm uh, thrombosis and uh, there are hereditary causes as well as acquired causes for the same and uh, the most common cause of uh, thrombophilia is anti phospholipid syn uh, syndrome and it is an acquired cause and it is also a treatable cause of thrombophilia and the detection therefore becomes important because not only does it cause thrombosis but so many other uh, diseases or uh, symptoms apart from thrombosis there are other acquired disorders also Uh, which cause thrombophilia but uh, i would like to mention hereditary causes of thrombophilia here because uh, uh, with hereditary causes of thrombophilia if they are presenting with thrombosis uh, 
then the patient would require lifelong anticoagulation. So that is why it is important to know that in which a group of patient do we just require anticoagulation for a certain period of time till the acute episode of thrombosis has passed or which group of disorders you would want to give a lifelong anticoagulation and to mention one of the most common hereditary disorders is factor V laden mutation followed by prothrombin gene mutation, elevated factor A, hyperhomocysteinemia, and other like deficiency of antithrombin uh, 3, protein C, and S. So as you can see from this chart, this is a survey of uh, venous thromboembolic patients in which you see that uh, these were the uh, hereditary causes which was screened and it was found that the most prevalent was he uh, heterozygous factor V laden mutation followed by prothrombin gene mutation of course but this data is mainly from the Caucasian ethnicity and there is less data from Indian uh, Indian uh, population but still whatever we have Factor V laden is also common of all the hereditary disorders in India also. So, so uh, then there are acquired, uh, when we talk about thrombophilia, it is the tendency and there are causes, but more than the causes, it is the risk factors which we need to know and acquired factors which, which increase the risk of thrombophilia is very important because despite patient uh, carrying the mutation, which is thrombophilic in nature, presence or, or absence of acquired factors, risk factors really change the outcome of that patient and the clinical manifestation. Major surgery, trauma, immobilization for long periods, solid and hematological malignancies and drugs which are given in these conditions, pregnancy, oral contraceptives, uh, estrogen replacement therapy, APLA, HIT, PNH, obesity, nephrotic syndrome and smoking. These are one of, some of the few very important risk factors which affect the prognosis of a, a patient who is carrying hereditary factors uh, like heterozygous factor V laden mutation, so on and so forth. So uh, what causes this thrombophilia? Mutation, how, does it how is it responsible for that? So we all know that there is a Virchow's triad, which, uh, which consists of a hypercoagulable state that is called thrombophilia. Then there is, has to be some endothelial injury and venous stasis. So just one factor in uh, action may not lead to thrombosis. There is, there are, these are two different things. One is having thrombophilia and the other is getting thrombosis from that thrombophilic condition. That is the other matter. So just having a hypercoagulable state may not be enough. If it is accompanied by venous stasis or endothelial injury, then definitely the propensity of getting thrombosis increases many fold. So uh, just this is one uh, mechanism by which venous thromboembolism occurs in deep veins of legs. Here there are these uh, blood state stasis which has occurred and coupled by thromboembolism, there is uh, this uh, hypoxic state which is there inside this uh, cavity here. And uh, what happens is that platelets come in and along with other thrombophilia because of clotting factors and so many things, the thrombosis is formed. And this thrombosis can get dislodged eventually and cause embolism. So in atrial fibrillation, for example, what happens is that uh, there is hypertrophy of the cardiac muscle and because of which there are areas where there is some 
uh, variation and turbulence in the blood flow, which also causes uh, some endothelial injury matrix changes apart from pockets of stasis. And that is a fertile ground for causing atrial thrombosis. And it is a very uh, important thing because this kind of uh, atrial thrombosis will lead to stroke or MI. On the other hand, if you get a, a deep vein thrombosis in the venous circulation, there are more chances or rather stroke is very, very unlikely because it is not able to pass the pulmonary circulation. It is pulmonary embolism, which becomes the terminal event in those situations. So that is why it is important to know that what kind of a presentation the patient is having, whether it is a venous thrombol thromboembolism or an arterial thromboembolism. So there are usual sites of uh, getting deep vein thrombosis and that is uh, in the legs. So you can see here there are pockets behind the valves where there is stasis. And if there is a prolonged surgery or a female is on OCs or on estrogen re replacement therapy, which, increase, uh, which uh, generates a thrombophilic state, then uh, there are high chances that one gets thrombi in the legs, which can get dislodged and cause pulmonary embolism. But apart from this, there are unusual sites of uh, uh, thrombosis or venous thrombosis that is inside the abdomen, whether it is a portal vein thrombosis or a mesenteric vein thrombosis. Uh, like you can see in this diagram, you have a portal vein thrombosis. It's also in the, so it can be in the superior mesenteric art, uh, vein or an inferior mesenteric vein or a splenic vein. So these are rare or unusual sites of uh, venous thrombosis. So why am I laying importance to usual site and uh, unusual site? It is because usually when you get a DVT, it is more of acquired and local factors which may play an important role. And so if you treat that local condition, patient will be normal and may not get thrombosis again. But if you are getting thrombosis in these unusual sites, then there is more to whatever is seen. For example, it may be an anti-thrombin-3 deficiency or a hereditary thrombophilia of a severe kind, which is presenting in unusual sites. PNH also is another condition which will uh, result in a thrombosis in unusual situations. So therefore, knowing whether venous thrombosis is in usual site or unusual site will help us decide that what may be the underlying etiology of thrombosis. So there are other causes of thrombosis apart from thrombophilia, which I mentioned, and that is uh, some patients get it on drugs, then there can be thrombocytosis, which increases the hemoconcentration and therefore produces some stasis. The similar pathophysiology can occur with polycythemia also. Aplastic anemia also may lead to uh, uh, thrombosis, ITP, leukemia, and PNH. So definitely when you're looking at these conditions, they're quite obvious, uh, apart from PNH, they're quite obvious on initial clinical and CBC examinations. So you know that these are the reasons of thrombosis. But in unusual sites, you may not get very obvious signs and you need to work for hereditary, work up for hereditary thrombophilia and PNH in those areas. So thrombophilia is increased tendency and uh, there are very uh, there are list of tests which are costly uh, and uh, they need to be uh, ordered and interpreted with caution because there's so many confounders attached to them. So now I will come to one, some of, I will discuss some of the main thrombophilic disorders and give you a overview of how to, uh, when to test for these disorders and how to test for it or whether at all testing will be helpful or not. So the most common one is antiphospholipid syndrome, which is, uh, which everyone 
must have come across in the clinical practice, whether it is the medicine people or gynae people or skin people, and of course, the pathologists. So it is the most common cause of acquired thrombophilia. And it is basically the autoantibodies are directed against the anionic phospholipids and they promote thrombosis. But what is peculiar about this, these uh, autoantibodies is that when you detect them in vitro, uh, they rather than reducing the APTT, they increase the APTT because they prevent the binding of uh, clotting factors on phospholipids. So this also becomes a way of detecting uh, anti-phospholipid antibodies and diagnosing them. So clinical presentation, it can cause both arterial and venous thrombosis and recurrent pregnancy loss. And uh, it can be prima primary where the underlying etiology may not be found out, or it can be associated with other conditions like SLE, etc. And it is also known as these antibodies are also known as lupus anticoagulant. So why this name lupus anticoagulant is there is that uh, lupus is systemic lupus erythrom erythromatosis, SLE, and these are very commonly seen in SLE. So the name lupus comes from there. And anticoagulant because uh, in vitro, it causes increased or prolonged APTT. In fact, in a lab, if when you are doing randomly PT, uh, APTT test and you get an asymptomatic patient with a prolonged APTT, there are very high chances that that patient has lupus anticoagulant and you need to check, up for, check for that lupus anticoagulant. So for diagno diagnosing of uh, uh, APLA, we have clinical criteria and we have laboratory criteria and both are important for diagnosis. So the patient should have either vascular thrombosis in more than one arterial venous or small vessel site or pregnancy morbidity. So uh, first fetal death or premature birth before 34 weeks or eclampsia, se uh, severe preeclampsia, placental insufficiency and more than three episodes of uh, embryonic loss. So if you look at it, uh, fetal death beyond 10 weeks and premature birth become just you need more than one episode and you can clinically suspect APLA in those cases. And what do you do in laboratory? You have to demonstrate lupus anticoagulant positivity on two occasions and it should be 12 weeks apart and anti-cardiolipin ad antibody in medium or high titer, it can be either or both IgG and IgM. And the medium to high titer means above 99 percentile. And uh, this again should be 12 weeks apart. Similarly, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1, medium to high titer and detected 12 weeks apart. So uh, why is this 12 weeks uh, or number given to it because we believe that within 12 weeks if there is some uh, false positivity in detection because uh, these antibodies can be a big, uh, can develop transiently in any acute phase, phase reaction and uh, those transient antibodies may not actually cause increased risk of thrombosis so all those things uh, of infection inflammation, will settle down by 12 weeks and even and after settling still if it is coming as positive then you know that you are dealing with the lupus anticoagulant which is which can cause may cause clinically significant thrombosis so laboratory criteria we, we should have positive lupus anticoagulant test positive acl test uh, or positive beta-2 glycoprotein test. This is quite specific for uh, anionic phospholipids and uh, antibodies generated against them and should persist for two or more occasions, 12 weeks apart. And when you talk about lupus anticoagulant, it should be demonstrated by more than one method. 
So I'll be briefly discussing with you how you do that lupus anticoagulant test because in all the labs, uh, we uh, in, med in any lab which is dealing with a sufficiently high number of cases uh, from, which come from gynae or medicine derma, uh, LA testing is a very common referral. So we should know when do we, when do we call it as lupus anticoagulant is present. So at least two screening tests that demonstrate prolongation of phospholipid dependent clotting time based on different test principles. Then the second is mixing studies to confirm the presence of inhibitor and exclude a factor deficiency. Then a confirmatory test that demonstrates phospholipid dependence of inhibitor and rule out other causes of prolongation that may be due to specific inhibitor or presence of drugs. So the presence of drugs and all uh, will be excluded by good clinical history, but two screening tests in which uh, you should be able to demonstrate that it is this abnormal result is because of phospholipid dependence of the inhibitor. And the other is mixing study to first of all demonstrate that inhibitors do exist in the plasma of the patient. So I, um, the recommendations are the two tests based on different principles and DRVV universally by all regulatory bodies have come to this consensus that this should be the first test which should be done to screen patients of lupus anticoagulant and then second ten, uh, and it should be followed by sensitivity to low phospholipids uh, or silica as activator or KCT. So confirmation is that when there is a prolonged APTT or a clotting test uh, when, uh, for lupus as a screening test, so when you add more of phospholipids, those increase in clotting tests should now come down. So if you're able to demonstrate that on screening tests, the, uh, it is sensitive to phospholipid and there is a prolonged clotting time and after addition of phospholipid the clotting time has reduced that is an evidence of lupus anticoagulant. The pitfall of KCT amongst all these tests is that it is difficult to be automated because it is it has particulate kaolin which settles and it doesn't form a uniform suspension. So mostly we for reliable results we do it uh, manually. So just a brief uh, overview of various screening tests which are available and how this tests for phospholipids sensitivity. So DRVV basically tests this part where uh, uh, action on uh, factor 10 is there. Then a uh, star, star clot uh, and KCT check for phospholipids in this limb. Then a diluted prothrombin time, extrinsic pathway, and its dependence on phospholipids. So uh, these are various levels, uh, areas which are tested by the, these various screening tests. So coming to dilute Russell venom viper test. So what we mainly do in this is that we check for uh, we all know that when there is coagulation happening, it is not just the coagulation cascade which is responsible for uh, forming the thrombus. It requires a phospholipid scaffold. Uh, it requires a support of phospholipid on which these uh, coagulation proteins uh, uh, get concentrated and produce thrombus. So what happens is that this phospholipid, when you given very uh, in in vitro tests if you just give just the right amount of phospholipid then uh, it becomes sensitive for lupus anticoagulant because whatever lupus anticoagulant is present is able to coat or neutralize the phospholipids and prevents the bind uh, prevents the a constant uh, these uh, proteins, coagulation proteins from settling on the phospholipid and causing coagulation. So that is why if a uh, very low amount of phospholipid is there and lupus is also there, the clotting time prolongs. 
So the, here in this, we uh, add dilute Russell Viper time to initiate coagulation. And in presence of lupus, it is not able to uh, cause clotting as quickly as it would have caused in its absence. So why is it the most important screening test? Because it is most sensitive to, to beta-2 glycoproteins, which are uh, most specific uh, antibodies which are produced in APLA. And, it, and DRBV, the studies show that uh, correlate very strongly with thrombosis. And, not, and this also does not if, uh, get affected by deficiencies located in the coagulation ca cascade. So that is why it is able to re reduce the confounding effect of so many other things which may very frequently happen in uh, any coagulation testing. So the normal range is 24 to 26 seconds for DRVV. And if it is more than 26 seconds, then the screen is positive. And so DRVV, by screening through DRVV, we know that there is an inhibitor which is sensitive for low level of phospholipids. So the next level is to confirm it as the recommendations say and confirm doubly about the uh, dependence on phospholipids. So in DRV, we confirm what happens is that excessive phospholipids are supplied and which neutralize all the anticoagulant, uh, lupus anticoagulant, and therefore the clotting time reduces. So if uh, firstly in screen it is prolonged and in confirm it reduces, then it is a clear cut evidence of lupus anticoagulant. So how, we, how do we report the essay? So DRVV screen is reported as the ratio of patient's DRVV result over the mean DRVV result which is in the normal range which lab establishes. So confirm ratio is also on the similar lines. The time for patients uh, confirm uh, seconds clotting time and the mean uh, clotting time of the normal range of patients. And then the final integrated result, integrated result, meaning that final call or final stake comes when we uh, express it as normalized ratio. And normalized ratio is uh, DRVV screen over DRVV confirm ratio. So if it is more than 1.2, it is highly suggestive of uh, lupus anticoagulant. So that is first thing that you've demonstrated lupus anticoagulant by two methods. One is uh, screening and then confirming it by uh, its phospholipid dependence. Then the next is, uh, there are other methods also which are available. But before that, just some precautions that sample before starting uh, should be taken before uh, anticoagulation is started or two weeks after stopping anticoagulation. Because uh, vitamin K antagonists give a false positive result because they will increase any kind of uh, clotting based assay, the clotting time of any clotting based assay. And factor five laden mutation or factor five deficiency may interfere in the test. Then there is another thing like silica clotting time. It is on the similar lines as DRVV. The only difference is that instead of DRVV, we are adding silica to initiate coagulation. And uh, one, more than 1.16 is suggestive of lupus. Then uh, star, uh, star clot is uh, uh, a very good test, which is done by Stago automated uh, uh, coagulometers. And the principle is that, uh, is that they're, they're, they add HPE, which is hexagonal phase phosphatidyl ethanolamine, which neutralizes LAC. So when you add HPE, the LAC, uh, in presence of LAC, the APTT will shorten. So if AP, APTT is not shortening, that means LAC is not present. But if APTT is shortening after adding HPE, that means that lupus anticoagulant is present in that. And the difference of uh, on adding and without adding, if it is more than eight seconds, it is suggestive of 
lupus anticoagulant. Then uh, KCP, uh, very old institutes and traditional institutes uh, do it. And it is a kaolin clotting time and in which we uh, compare the values in the three different mixtures which are produced. One is patient's plasma with kaolin and measuring the clotting time. Then one is to one mix and NPP, normal plasma versus kaolin. And then the results are expressed. So the normal clotting time is 60 to 120 seconds. And KCT index, uh, which is clotting time of B minus C upon A, that is the KCT index. And if it is more than 15%, then it is positive for lupus anticoagulant. So pre-analytical variables in LA is presence of residual uh, platelets in plasma because platelets are a rich source of uh, phos uh, phospholipids. So if platelets are present, then uh, its sensitivity for lupus will reduce because the lupus will be absorbed on platelets and we will not be able to test its in vitro anticoagulant property. So therefore, it is recommended that whenever we are testing for LA, we should do double centrifugation twice so that the platelets are less than 10,000 per microliter. So that should be the target. Then coming to the next group of studies, that is mixing studies, and we all are familiar with it, and we routinely do it for checking whether there is a inhibitor or there is a deficient deficiency present in the plasma in which we do a one is to one mix. So normal plasma with patient plasma is mixed. So if the clotting time or APTT reduces, that means there is deficiency. If it does not reduce, then it's presence of inhibitor. So it is as simple as that. And we also repeat it after two hours so that we rule out factor A dependent inhibitors. If you remember the guidelines, the last point was to rule out other causes of inhibitors. So this is testing for lupus anticoagulant. And these are the battery of tests we do to double check whether lupus anticoagulant is present on, or not. Then there are these ELISA-based tests for directly checking the antibodies and that is anti-cardiolipin antibody detection. One point to be noted is that high levels are seen also in rheumatoid arthritis and cryoglobulins and infections. And therefore, if it is present, uh, we need to do repeat it. If we get a high value, we need to repeat it after 12 months to rule out any transient thing. And therefore, for the same reason, the IgG subtype is more relevant than the IgM subtype because that means that there is a sustained increase in anti-cardiolipin -car antibody production. Similarly, anti-beta-2 uh, glycoprotein 1, it is more specific than anti-cardiolipin antibodies and removes the problem of false positivity because of infections. So beta-2 glycoprotein is a better and a preferred method than anti-cardiolipin antibodies. So uh, interference in testing is uh, when there is acute thrombotic events, which may cause a false negative, acute phase response with elevated factor eight, which can occur in acute thrombosis. And if the patient is on an, uh, vitamin K antig antagonist therapy. So therefore in short, whenever we are doing uh, lupus testing, basically clotting based tests, this is more to do with clotting-based tests than ELISA-based tests. So it is better that before we start with anticoagulation, that time we do, or we wait for the acute thrombosis to settle, anticoagulation to stop, and then we should uh, uh, do this uh, clotting-based assay. But during that uh, episode, we could still do a beta-2 glycoprotein, which would give us some uh, information. So it should be tested one to three weeks after discontinuation of therapy. And when after cessation of therapy, PT INR has come back to one, one point, less than 1.5. So 
uh, one very important thing is a patient selection for LA testing should be good because only high grade uh, clinical criteria will improve the true positives. Low grade, like we uh, thromboembolism occurring in elder, elderly, mostly it is acquired causes. So if you do LA testing in this, there can be more false positive. So prolonged APTT in asymptomatic recurrent early pregnancy loss, not late pregnancy loss, early pregnancy loss, and provoke VET. Provoke meaning that there are some acquired factors like patient is on uh, OCs or smoker or such, uh, such situations. And if you get a prolonged APTT, then uh, you are... Uh, a uh, more uh, clear that could it could be positive, but there are higher chances that it could be negative too. So a uh, high grade is one thing in which definitely you need LA testing, and the false positives will be very low in these cases. So it is unprovoked VT in young patients less than fifty years. It is thrombosis a usual unusual sites. I was talking about the sites of thrombosis. So unusual sites, definitely you need to do thrombophilia te uh, testing and all, especially APLA because it is the most common thrombophilia. Late pregnancy loss and thrombosis of pregnancy morbidity in patients with autoimmune disease. So these this category of patient selection, the false positives will be minimum. Then coming to the next condition that, uh, and this is the most common uh, hereditary thrombophilia uh, we encounter, and uh, it is activated protein C resistance and factor V laden mutation. So protein C we all know is an anticoagulant, and when there is resistance to action of protein C. It, there is a failure of anticoagulation and therefore the propensity of getting thrombosis. The prevalence is as high as 20% in a patient who has first episode of DVT and in 50% of familial thrombosis. So it is as common as this and uh, heterozygous with uh, any acquired or set, another factor which is thrombophilic, there is a very high 30 to 60 fold chances of getting thrombosis. And these are the patients which would require uh, lifelong anticoagulation. So the laboratory essays of all these in general, I'll tell you as a blanket statement is there are two types of essays. One is the functional essays, which a test for the function of uh, that particular protein deficiency. And the other is the quantitative or antigenic assay, which, uh, which detects the amount of uh, that uh, protein which is present. So functional assays will tell you qualitative defects and uh, uh, ELISA-based or antigenic assays will tell you the quantitative defects. So both work in tandem in these diseases to help diagnose uh, the particular deficiency. So here, these are values which you will get in the books. Normal APCR value is more than two seconds. And if it is between one to 1.5 to two, then it is zygous. And if it is less than 1.5, it is homozygous. And uh, this is the ratio actually of APTT in patient plasma and normal plasma before and after adding APC, that is activated protein C. So if protein C activist resistance is present, so there will not be much difference. But if it is not present, uh, if it there is no resistance, that means it's a normal pressure, uh, person, then there will be a difference in anticoagulation and the clotting times. So confounders are factor eight, elevated, low protein C, and prolonged baseline APTT because of certain drugs and liver dysfunction. So therefore, when you get these abnormal results, you need to confirm it, number one, and also check for the clinical status of the patient, the liver state especially, and the drugs. 
then of course, once you get these abnormal results, it would be desirable that if a DNA analysis could be done. And these days there are micro arrays in which more than one mutation can be tested together. So you have a whole panel of DNA micro array of common mutations, uh, and then you will get a molecular testing. And molecular testing advantage is that it is independent of what the clinical status of the patient is, whether the patient is on anticoagulation or is having liver dysfunction or is in the acute state of thrombosis, doesn't matter, it will still uh, be there. So the recommendation is that we should initially screen by a cost-effective clotting-based APCR assay, that is a functional assay. And if it comes out positive, then you can confirm by DNA. So when you confirm it by DNA, so it uh, negates any confounders which may be present. Similarly, a prothrombin gene mutation, it is very rare in Asians and uh, it constitutes 20% of ET in thrombophilic families. But all this data from literature mostly is from the West and very little is from the Indian part of the continent. So here, uh, heterozygous have a threefold increase in VT and increase much more in addition when there is additional or acquired risk factor. But, and this line is true for all kinds of hereditary thrombophilias that if you have more than one thrombophilic uh, tendency, then your chances of thrombosis increase. And then you may have to end up with a lifelong anticoagulation. So diagnosis is by molecular methods by which you do a, uh, you can do by PCR or microarray. Then protein C deficiency, uh, the patient presence at a younger age. And what, what is peculiar about this is that there is an increased risk of warfarin-induced in, skin necrosis. We all know that uh, when we start with anticoagulation, we start with heparin and then uh, change it to warfarin gradually. And if you don't go by this step, step then there is an increased tendency of warfarin-induced skin necrosis which occurs. So this transition uh, and prepare the predisposes uh, disposition of getting skin necrosis becomes much more in patients who may have protein C deficiency, whether it is acquired or hereditary, irrespective of that. It has got to do with levels of protein C. And homozygotes uh, do not exist or are very rare because it's almost very fatal and patient may get neonatal, if at all they are there, then neonatal purpura fulminance is one of the clinical presentations and DIC. Acquired deficiency is much more common than hereditary forms. And whenever we have detected protein C deficiency by functional assays, then you definitely have to rule out uh, acquired causes before considering hereditary. And one very easy way of confirming it is repeating the test after say six months or after some time so that if there, it is because of some acquired factors which don't exist anymore, so the uh, levels will come back to normal which won't happen in a hereditary disorder. So acquired or low protein uh, C, if you get uh, the acquired causes are more common and what are those? There is liver disease, warfarin therapy, vitamin K deficiency, recent or current thrombosis, DIC, L asparaginase therapy, which you get given ALL, nephrotic syndrome, because it's a lot of protein loss in nephrotic syndrome, which occurs in an immediate post-operative period, neonates. And high pro protein C is seen, is seen in pregnancy and OCs, and that is why this is one acquired cause of thr uh, thrombophilia, which is there. It is because of increase in protein C. So when you have low protein C, you need to consider all these reasons before considering that it is a hereditary cause. So lab diagnosis, again, functional or immunogenic. And uh, whatever it is, initial screen should be confirmed by genetic testing for accurate diagnosis. And uh, 
Then coming to protein C deficiency. Uh, this, uh, there are, again, the, the same thing goes for protein S deficiency also. It has functional assay, which is clot-based assay, and false increase happens in anticoagulation, lupus anticoagulant, and factor V laden mutation. And uh, therefore, immunogenic causes, uh, immunogenic uh, methods become better way of detecting protein S deficiency. And again, in this case also, acquired are more common than hereditary. So acquired is uh, acute phase response, elevated factor eight, infection, autoimmune disorders, HIV and in IBD. And levels are lower in women, uh, especially during hormone replacement therapy, OCs, and in second and third trimester of pregnancy. And that is why, uh, if you remember, uh, third trimester loss becomes a very ominous reason for an inherited thrombophilia that you need to consider. Then next is anti-thrombin uh, 3 deficiency. So this is the worst kind of inherited thrombophilia philia, because it confers the highest risk of uh, uh, developing a thrombosis and homozygous status universally fatal in utero. So we always mostly get heterozygous state and uh, this presence with thrombosis in the unusual sites. So APLA is one thing, PNH is another one, and antithrombin 3 is the third one, uh, which you should consider when you get uh, thrombosis in the unusual sites. And in young people with thrombosis, especially unprovoked. So again, here you have functional and qualitative as well as quantitative assays, and uh, both are required and both have their own merits. Again, here, acquired must be excluded and acquired antithrombin 3 deficiency occurs when patient is on heparin, L aspirogenase, liver disease, and increased loss in nephrotic syndrome. Then coming to hyperhomocysteinemia. Till now, we were considering protein C, protein S, and antithrombin 3, and uh, factor 5 laden mutation, and they all are anticoagulants which have which are in lower amounts hyperhomocysteinemia is slightly different in its mechanism of action as far as the development of uh, thrombosis is considered and a patient of hyperhomocysteinemia apart from having a uh, venous thrombo uh, thromboembolism can also have arterial thromboembolism peripheral artery disease stroke aneurysm migraine hypertension and recurrent pregnancy loss and neural tube defects because of hyperhomocysteinemia per se. And this is second, uh, this could be secondary to vitamin B6, B12, or folate deficiency. And uh, therefore, by giving supplementation with this, uh, one could uh, change the risk, risk of getting. Uh, from uh, venous thrombosis. Although the data does not support it so much that if you treat B12 deficiency or B6 deficiency, high risk of high, uh, thrombosis by hyperhomocysteinemia, does it ameliorate or not? Then renal failure, hypothyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, and various drugs all cause acquired hyperhomocysteinemia. Apart from that, there is hereditary hyperhomocysteinemia and homozygous, uh, because of homozygous alteration of MTHFR gene, which is present in 10 to 13% of the population. So when to test? So lower have not been uh, proven to reduce the thrombotic rate, and there's a moderate increase in thrombophilia risk and lack of e evidence for therapeutic benefit. So, uh, Therefore, the routine testing of MTFR polymer polymorphisms are not uh, currently suggested and, on, and are not currently done because uh, even if you establish that, okay, it is there and you give supplementation, it has not conferred that you change the behavior of generation of thrombosis. Then elevated factor eight, 
so what genetic involvement is uh, genetic uh, mutations are causing this elevated factor 8 are not clearly understood but uh, it is higher in certain ethnic groups and factor 8 becomes increase in acute phase reaction estrogen pregnancy and after aerobic exercise and is lower in blood group o so these are physiological variations in factor 8 levels but if you see a persistent factor 8 level, which is more than 150% in absence of acute phase reaction, elevated estrogen or recent exercise, then you can say that, okay, this is a risk factor independent of all other things which, are, which is going to increase the tendency of clot formation. So when to test at least six months after acute thrombotic event, or six weeks after giving birth to be repeated after three to six months to confirm persistent elevation. Then there are fibrinogen defects and dysfibrinogenemia. They it can give rise to both bleeding tendency and clotting tendency. So lab approach is uh, measuring the fibrinogen levels by both immunogenic and clotting based assays. And again, tested after six months of acute a thrombosis because fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant. So to uh, this brings me to the end of this part of my talk, which just familiarizes you with various uh, uh, causes and how they can be tested. And of this antithrombin-3 protein C, S, we have some data on the prevalence of it and what is the risk factor of this. And the maximum risk factor is of these three uh, diseases compared to the others. So what is the approach? So approach begins from the clinical history. And uh, clinical history means that the age of presentation, the site of thrombosis, and whether it was associated with bleeding or any other uh, thing, whether it is also associated with any medical condition like liver disorders, cardiovascular disease, pregnancy, and also drug history, whether patient has received any chemotherapy or not. And last but not the least, history of similar disorder in the family to establish whether you are dealing with a hereditary thrombophilia or an acquired thrombophilia. So the aim is to really identify the hereditary thrombophilia and how lab testing helps. Lab text testing helps. It is very difficult uh, and equivocal uh, to test during acute thrombosis except in purpura fulminance. And uh, normal levels, if you do test and you get normal levels of ac in acute thrombosis, then you can fairly with some confidence or good confidence rule out those as the causes. But if you get low levels of say protein C, protein S, then you need to repeat it again because physiologically in acute thrombosis, they will reduce. Then... Uh, family screening, genetic counseling, and primary prophylaxis of relatives in high-risk situations, you would want to do a thrombophilia testing. But one thing one should remember is that this patient selection should be carefully done because it is costly and may not give you good answers eventually. So whom to test? Uh, this I've already discussed in the lupus anticoagulant part of my talk. But just to repeat it again, idiopathic or re recurrent venous thromboembolism, especially in young age, strong family history, unusual sites, neonatal purpura fulminance, warfarin-induced skin necrosis, and recurrent pregnancy loss, especially in the third trimester. So uh, at least four to six weeks should have passed after acute thrombotic event, and at least two weeks after this continuation of anticoagulants when we should do thrombophilia testing. And uh, in acute, like I was telling you that if in acute thrombosis we get the normal levels then we can exclude the deficiency at least of these. In acute phase, what we can do if we are suspecting APLA is 
do a beta one uh, uh, glycoprotein testing, and if you are suspecting hereditary thrombo uh, thrombophilia, then you could do a DNA based uh, uh, testing. So it is that important. Otherwise, you will have to wait. So recommendation is per, uh, perform at least after four to six weeks after the episode or dis discontinuation. And if abnormal results are found during acute illness or anticoagulation, then repeat defin uh, should definitely be done and you cannot rely on that. Testing may be delayed until acute clinical. This is the same thing I'm repeating again and again, just to emphasize that when we should be testing because that is the most that is the first step towards a uh, right uh, diagnosis. So this is my second last slide, uh, slide in which what panel you should put for screening and what after that for which hypercoagulability factors. So PT, APTT, and then stag stago based uh, clot for lupus, anticarbulibin assay and beta uh, you can do for a APLA if you're suspecting hereditary then uh, you will like to do protein C, S, and antithrombin functional assays. And timing definitely needs to be after four to six weeks of acute episode. And then uh, repeated by antigenic assays. And you could also do DNA-based assays. Then CRP, factor rate, and fibrinogen. So they will tell you whether inflammation is ongoing or not. So you can correctly interpret fibrinogen and uh, factor eight levels. Then APCR confirmed by molecular testing. And then this uh, prothrombin and homocysteine is what you could do just to know that, pro okay, just to uh, complete the list uh, of diagnosis. So to summarize the take home messages, the testing done should be after careful selection of the patient and time of testing and defer till the acute episode has done uh, has um, is over and repeat testing once you get an abnormal res result after some time so with that i would like to end my talk uh, thank you